as I mentioned at the beginning of Mass, tonight we are continuing our Year of Mercy series in which we have been focusing on the corporal and spiritual works of mercy. At the beginning of the Jubilee Year of Mercy, Pope Francis said that it is his burning desire that the Christian people reflect on the corporal and spiritual works of mercy as the mystery of mercy is the bridge which connects God and humanity. Mother Teresa of Calcutta was certainly one who connected God and humanity through her service to the poorest of the poor. As Pope Francis stated in his homily for Mother's Canonization Mass on September the 4th, in all aspects of her life, Mother was a generous dispenser of divine mercy, making herself available for everyone through her welcome and defense of human life, those unborn, and those abandoned and discarded. Her mission to the urban and existential peripheries remains for us today an eloquent witness to God's closeness to the poorest of the poor. Tonight, we're delighted to have participate in our series, one of Mother Teresa's closest collaborators and one of my dearest friends, Sandra McMurtry. Sandy has worked with Mother for many more years than she would want me to state, uh, traveling with Mother throughout the world and being an instrument of God's love and mercy to those in most need. For those of you who do not know, the Missionaries of Charity, Mother Teresa's sisters, have a house here in Northeast Washington, which Sandy helped begin with Mother, and to this day, Sandy ensures that it remains at the service of Humanities Forgotten. Please welcome Sandy McMurtry. The church has proclaimed Mother Teresa to be a saint within less than two decades of her death. What the world had known to be true and observed through her public lifetime made more public than most through the advent of social media. <clears throat> Possibly reflecting God's will that she be raised up now at this time in our lifetime for the millions in the world who can remember her walking here alongside of us. Actually, often right here in this city, in this basilica, right here in this crypt church, countless times. We witnessed her as humble, cheerful, fun, witty, positive, profoundly prayerful, and harder working than any of us, a deep loving soul beyond all others. Perhaps some of you here tonight who may have met her experienced that look of love when she looked you in the eye as if there was no one else in the room. I will try to shed a little bit of light onto this path of sanctity tonight. And yet unbeknownst to any of us, she suffered almost five decades in the darkest of nights. After once hearing God's word, following his wishes, she then received no spiritual consolation for 50 years. This fact alone distinguishes her from all of the saints who have suffered and known the agonies of the dark night of the soul. Such suffering cannot be measured, but this 50-year duration will undoubtedly be studied by theologians for many years to come. And in light of the fact that her, that her demeanor never exposed this inner turmoil, then they are just now awakening to her towering spirituality. Our mother paid an extraordinary price, denying herself and carrying this cross deep within, so deep that those closest to her had no inkling of it whatsoever. In 1981, I traveled to Calcutta, a newly single mother with three children during a period of great personal pain and sorrow with a woman named Berta McCann, a family friend and director of CRS projects around the world, who knew Mother slightly. After seeing Mother Teresa on television one evening in January 1981, I knew that I needed to meet this woman of faith and that she would be the key to helping the four of us come out on the other side of this period as a loving and united family. Sounds unusual, I know, but after much cajoling of my family and settling down unsettled parents, I moved heaven and earth to get there. 
In the end, they saw my determination, and they acquiesced and helped me work it all out and make arrangements for my children. For that, I am, of course, ever grateful. Leaving my children for that amount of time was totally out of character, and they knew it. But I knew I had to go. We left on April 28, 1981, exactly three months after I had seen Mother Teresa on television. I later learned that Mother's modus operandi in all things was let no obstacle stand in her way. When you are certain you are following the will of God, watching her follow this rule she had made for herself was an astronomic lesson in faith, hope, and courage. What I could not have known then was that this outrageously holy, loving, extraordinary woman was going to take me, a very broken, wounded person, in as her child, become my spiritual advisor, confidant, give me my fourth child as a gift out of the blue while we were traveling together in Mexico for three weeks, and become her godmother. Nor could I have known that she would take me along on so many of her magnificent adventures. I actually met Mother Teresa the first time in the Calcutta airport in the middle of the night. It turned out that the last leg of our journey to Calcutta was a direct flight from Hong Kong. Mother and one of her sisters were on that same flight. I remember just seeing her actually seated across from us and being overwhelmed by that coincidence. In the airport, she approached us, having no idea who I was. It was astonishing. After all that had transpired, I was face to face with this magnificent small person that my heart had ached to find and was actually me, this was actually happening in the middle of the airport. She was more than I could have hoped for. Just the sight of her and the sound of her voice brought me almost to tears. After a few moments of conversation, she invited me to help with her luggage. 25 boxes tied with twine, identified only with Mother Teresa written by hand on each box, no address and then told us to go to our hotel, get some rest, and to come to Mother House in the morning to see her. The ride to our hotel in the dark of night with a nighttime temperature of 102, as we passed whole families and people of all ages sleeping on the streets wrapped with whatever they could find, literally hundreds of them along our route, gave me the very first glimpse of Mother's unceasing sacrifice and the the wonderful courage that allowed her to follow Christ's call to the poor initially and live it every day in this place she called home that can assault your every sense, sight, hearing, heat, and sounds for the remainder of her life. In the three and a half weeks to follow, I watched and worked next to this saintly woman as she bathed and comforted and loved one skeletal dying person after another one leper after another, one orphan after another, and play with the little ones day after day, always doing as much or more than anyone else, as she would call it, doing the needful, and never her eyes straying from each one, one at a time, who at that particular moment in time became the absolute center of her universe. Again, I could not know then that I would be seeing and sharing this very same love in action throughout the U.S. and other travels in the next 16 years. In the U.S., there was tremendous focus on the lonely and the unloved, a different kind of poverty that she witnessed here in our country, spoke about often, and acted on repeatedly. Her great gift of healing for many was to unite those who might not be lacking in material gifts, but perhaps suffering poverty of spirit with the homeless, the sick, the hungry, the weak, and the disenfranchised. After tearfully leaving her in Calcutta, I re re arrived home with a note from Mother to then Archbishop Hickey, asking that he include me in preparation on the houses that he had arranged for her in Hanacostia to begin her work. My children and I, along with others, began preparing, painting, cleaning, planting flowers, moving in furniture. We drove to New York to pick up mother in a large RV, driving her to DC with 10 sisters and their mattresses, stopping for a picnic along the way on the Jersey Turnpike. 
We had two houses on the property, one for the convent, one for a soup kitchen, perhaps a shelter. They had been arranged and furnished as such. Mother being a true mother to the sisters and a woman at heart and loving her homes proceeded to rearrange the houses, moving the convent to the large house, the soup kitchen to the smaller house, and then a few hours later back again. She tended to every single detail in each of these homes, arrangements of furniture for the shelters, hanging pictures, arranging the kitchens, keeping the home so simple but very welcoming. I saw her do this numerous times throughout the United States and Canada every time we opened a new foundation, just as you or I would do if we were moving into a new home. She was sometimes criticized for meeting with controversial heads of state, heads of business, high people as mother called them, in order to make something happen or change for the poor. If she saw the need, she would go to the ends of the earth to fill it, but never once would she compromise her love for Jesus or leave him out of the conversation. She always considered it a gift for the giver, whomever he or she might be, to be able to do something for Jesus in his distressing disguise. On occasion, organizations or individuals would try to put mother in difficult positions, as when her photo at the grave of Anvir Huja, I can't really pronounce this, the communist leader of Albania who died in 1985 was published across the world. Mother had been told she was going to visit her mother's grave as she stood there with cameras snapping, she said quietly, saying nothing prior, simply, now may I go to my mother's grave. Once on a trip to Gallup, New Mexico to open a house to serve American Indians, a gentleman came by. He wanted to see mother. He brought her a gift. He asked for 10 minutes of her time. She visited with him and he departed. Then it was a very, very large gift, very nice gift. Mother had not met him before this. The next day, we went on a helicopter ride to go over the land to see where Mother felt it would be best to create a home for the American Indians. We returned, and we got off the helicopter, and there was a young man there who uh, was the son-in-law of the man who had been there the day before, and he had been with him that day. He said, Mother, um, I'm so-and-so. And she said, oh, yes, I remember you. And he said, my father-in-law would like you to come in March to his company and speak to everyone, to all of the people in his company. And Mother said, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm never in the US in March. And he said, but Mother, do you remember we were here yesterday? And mother said, yes, I know, thank you very much, but I'm never here in March. I tell this one story because it shows the depth of mother's devotion to her mission and that there were never compromises or paybacks. There are many other stories like this one, but I just feel that that's, that's a good point to make. As I have said, it was my extraordinary gift to witness sanctity in action being so frequently by her side during trips to Calcutta, making eight to 10 visits during those 16 years to work with her, two of which were when mother was hospitalized. The sisters would call and say, she wasn't doing well, perhaps it would be a good idea if I could come to be with her. She was a terrible patient. Whenever she was hospitalized, I, I began to think that they just wanted me there for a buffer, but one of the times I walked into her hospital room and she was there and a couple sisters and they were looking very sad and mother said, oh, thank goodness you have come now. You can make them, let, you can make them take me home. And I said, no, mother, I can't do that. We were there for another week. She was not happy. We were very happy because we had adoration, rosary, mass, everything in her room for that whole week, which was, which was really wonderful. She was a saint who was stubborn, and she was smart in her determination to bring love and aid to the poor in spirit, as well as the economically impoverished. More importantly, I saw her stubbornness played out in traveling extensively 
with and for her throughout the US, India, Rome, Poland, Canada, Central America, Brazil, Mexico, Cuba, Guantanamo Bay, and Romania. Whether it meant saying nine memoraries in Thanksgiving for something that she had not re yet received, planning miraculous medals or St. Joseph's statues in the front of a house she wanted for the sisters, or convincing a head of state or high person that the idea he or she had refused her in the beginning ended up being the best idea that he or she had ever had. She had consummate faith and hope that the Blessed Mother would come through for her, and she always did, perhaps with only one or two exceptions that I am aware of. Case in point, Cuba and Fidel Castro, 1986. Mother made three trips to Cuba during the efforts to open a house for her sisters there. I was with her. When she finally was granted a meeting with President Castro on our second visit after days of waiting, it went something like this. We were staying in a convent of, of guests of sisters who we had not known prior. There was nothing to do all day but wait. Guards were outside because we were not allowed to leave the building. Mother was, went, we waited a day and a half. He was supposed to call, he didn't call, and mother was, really the only word is stir crazy. She just couldn't, it, it, there was nothing to do and she would pace and she'd pray and, and then she'd say, why is he not calling? And then we'd go on and on and it was not the best of times, but eventually the call came and we went to see him, we were to have 15 minutes. Mother was to have 15 minutes. We were accompanied by men with machine guns. The president, who appeared delighted and fascinated by mother, kept extending the meeting. We left two and a half, laters, two and a half hours later, and she had convinced President Castro to allow her to open a house in Cuba for the elderly and the mentally ill a conversation that began with him saying there were no poor in Cuba, so there was no need for her to come. She was prepared and she was smart. He did not have a fear of the sisters working with the elderly or the mentally ill because they could not, they would not uprise, there was no problem. They now have eight or nine houses in Cuba. At the end of the meeting, mother, uh, President Castro gave mother a gift and I had her business cards, which had a prayer on them and the miraculous medals. And she turned and I held my hands out and she took my hand that had the medals and closed it and said, not yet, and gave him the business cards as the gift. So as I said, she never denied Jesus and she was very smart. We were two hours late for a scheduled mass immediately after that visit that was to take place outside of Havana. Even so, the church was overflowing with people in the sanctuary. Two side aisles were filled, the middle aisle, that side aisle. The sanctuary was completely filled with people. And mother was to walk down the center aisle. So there were police there, but they were of no use because they, everybody was clamoring to get a look at her. So we walked, I walked backward, she walked with me and made our way, it took us a half an hour, it was about this size to get down the center aisle. Then we walked her into the sacristy to find her a spot. I finally got her sit situated over to the side and, and it looked like everything was working out. I sat on her feet because there was pushing and shoving so she wouldn't fall and I feel this tap on my shoulder. And I look up and I, I, I hear mother say, my back is to Jesus, because we, she had been placed in front of the tabernacle. So we got up, moved everybody around some more, and put mother in an appropriate place. Humility. Humility was a part of her being. She spoke with high people in the exact same manner as she spoke with the poor or anyone else. She was treated as a star almost everywhere she went, and there were countless opportunities for her humility to be tested and wear just a little bit thin. Never once did I see that happen, nor did any of my colleagues or the sisters. Again, it was not a mask, it was a part of her being. 
She was always astonished that so many people would come out to see her. Saying one time when we were in a city and hundreds lined the highway, four of us were in the back seat, Bishop was in the front. As, as she was passing by, people were waving and carrying on, and she patted him on the back and said, oh, Bishop, wave to the people. They have all come out to see you. His response, I come by here very often, Mother, and believe me, they never come out to see me. Mother was in the back next to Mother, and she just put her head down, didn't say a word. Uh, there were times when she referred to herself as the, in the third person to kind of get away, I think, from the public persona. And her probably closest friend in life, uh, other than the sisters, was Eileen Egan, who, who was with her in the very beginning. And um, they were walking down the street in New York one time, Eileen told me, and their mother had done something and, and it was going to be in the paper. And so Eileen was looking through the paper and mother said, what are you doing? She said, I, I know there's an article. I'm looking, I'm looking to see if there's an, your pictures here. And she said, oh, never mind. Should they start walking? They're, Eileen's walking with the paper. Mother's walking here. Mother looks over, points to the picture and said, there she is. So that's... Mother's personality has not been frequently discussed or written about. She was pure joy. Traveling and just being with her was actually fun and exhilarating. She was fun-loving. She loved chocolate. She would pass it around but never take the first piece. The schedule for prayer was always followed, no matter where we were, in a car or a plane. She was funny and she was cute. She enjoyed relaxing on picnics with the sisters. She relished special days with them. The Christmas and Holy Day celebrations and feast days were very important to her. Laughter was a kind of a medicine, and she would often pass out special treats on those days. Fun was as important as was hard work, but always the rosary, adoration, prayer, and the mass. She seemed to exude grace, which resulted in an incredible energy which we benefited from on every single trip, long or short. She rarely stopped moving except for prayer and a few hours of sleep, unless it was, or a meeting. When we would leave her to go back to, home, to our homes, she would simply go on to the next place and keep moving, not so much to us. It became very evident to me that once I left her, her grace went with her. A wicked tiredness would set in. It was extreme, automatic, and came without fail. That never happened when you were by her side working. We would often try to trick mother when on the road by changing the clocks to allow her to get extra rest. She would never be fully angry, but there were times when she thought we were being overprotective, trying to shelter her from crowds or unnecessary meetings or herself. She would certainly let me know she did not necessarily like our plan, our efforts, our behavior, or my comments. At those times when she didn't appreciate one of my comments, she would simply look me in the eyes and do this. I can't tell you how many times that happened, particularly when I would be aggravated by someone who was constantly that. No one could change her views. Her strength of character was extreme. Although they were often challenged and sometimes misrepresented, Cardinal World told me just recently that Pope Francis had mentioned to him that the first time he ever saw Mother, it was at a very large bishop conference in Rome many, many years ago. He remembered that that he was overwhelmed at her strength, her outspokenness on the right issues, and again her courage and coming from such a small little woman. Obedience, her whole life was one of obedience to Christ, to the church, to the bishops. Her reverence for priests was ever evident. She went to confession not only to her father Van Exum, her true spiritual director, but to any priest who came to any house, running down the, the stairs to catch one before he left if she had missed her turn in the confessional. That was humility in action to me. She never opened a house anywhere without an explicit request and invitation from the bishop of the place. Oftentimes, these results and these, these requests came when there was an incident or problem in the, in the diocese that needed healing. 
She was authentic and she could provide that healing. They knew it and she was at their beck and call, always arriving with about at least three sisters and a sister superior. I read something recently from St. Francis de Sales. All the science of saints is included in these two things, to do and to suffer. And whoever will do these two things best has made himself most saintly. That was certainly our mother, and now she belongs to the world. I'd like to close with some words from mother to me, which you also may have read somewhere as well, but it was very significant when mother said them to me, we were discussing heaven. I am not sure exactly what heaven will be like, but I know when we die and it comes time for God to judge us, he will not ask how many good things you have done in your life. Rather, he will ask how much love did you put in the doing? And that is what matters the most. Thank you.